pray together. Father, as we have sung, we, we recognize that, uh, that you are the creator that made everything, all the beauty, all the complexity of our world, our universe, out of nothing by merely speaking it into existence. Father, you are the God that, that nothing is too difficult for and that you do the seemingly impossible uh, all the time. We think about the birth of Jesus as an example of that, and we certainly this time of year think of his uh, resurrection. And so, Father, we thank you for your power. We thank you for how you bring that to bear in our lives. And, Father, that we um, would not live life dependent upon our own strength, but in humility we would raise our hand often and say that we, we are weak and we need help and we need you to fill in a lot of gaps and that we'd reach out uh, to your power and that you would do um, amazingly, abundantly more than we could ever ask or imagine and we would give you uh, all uh, the glory. We thank you for this time to, to worship you. You and you alone are worthy of that worship and help us to do it in a way that would please you and put a smile on your face. And all God's people said, amen. Our statement of faith is uh, based on the Apostles' uh, Creed. If you're not familiar uh, with that, it's just a time in the history of the church where um, fellow Christians put together a statement that was basically the basics of the gospel and what Jesus is, is all about. So we're going to declare that uh, together should be uh, on the screen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Creation of
come to God's Word as we conclude the fifth chapter of Romans, and we hear that repetition of really important matters uh, that are worth repeating. They are matters of life or death, and they are matters for human flourishing. So may the Lord add the blessing to the reading and hearing and then the proclamation of his word. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Romans began by making clear the universality of sin and our personal responsibility in it, that there is no blame shifting before the bar of God. We can't say, well, it's his fault or her fault or their fault. Or uh, Romans 3.19 says that every mouth may be stopped, that we will just be silenced in trying to give or make excuse for sin. As we've seen stress throughout the fifth chapter, the effects of sin are such that humanity was brought under the reign or under the power of sin and death. As God told Adam, and as it indeed did occur, death came into the world as a result of sin. And humanity, indeed all of creation, lives under the reign of sin and death. And there is no maybe about whether we will one day die. Sometimes we observe that death is, is a part of the process of life. Palliative care is about giving comfort for people in the process of the end of life, meaning dying. Genesis makes clear that death was not part of God's good design for Adam. Adam. It was not part of God's design for Eden or for creation or for all humanity. It was the consequence of rebellion and disobedience of sin. The call to worship this morning was from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, dealing with Jesus' triumphal entry uh, into Jerusalem on what we now refer to as Palm Sunday. And the crowds there were rejoicing as they welcomed Jesus with blessed is, is uh, the King who comes in the name of the Lord and the, the Hosannas. All of that comes out of Psalm 118. And the, the call to praise God or else God would raise up uh, praises even from the rocks. But the next verse in that uh, passage in Luke 19 we did not read and it reads that when Jesus drew near to the city and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known this day the things that make for peace. And as the Apostle Paul writes to the church of Rome, there is that same sense of urgency. There is that same aching heart that they hear the gospel and believe the good news of the gospel. They receive the gospel for themselves. And that is still the hope whenever the gospel of Jesus Christ is proclaimed. The gospel is not merely good advice. The gospel is not just tips for healthier living. The gospel is not just one option among many for a right relationship with God. By definition, the gospel is good news. It's an announcement. It's a declaration. It is a heralding of news. When people walk through our gospel garden out on Oak Avenue, it is designed such that the, the preeminence of the Ten Commandments is there, that they would hear the law, they would read the law, and they would see their need in the light of God's law of, uh, of perfection and holiness for a Savior. And as you walk through the gospel garden, the gospel is proclaimed. It is set forth 
And just walking through the garden, the Holy Spirit may indeed encounter one and bring them to life in Christ. That's the reason for the gospel garden. Glenn Allen and I were away last week for a, just a wonderful wedding up in Charleston. We had opportunity to visit some of historic Charleston in just a few years. Uh, First Pres will be 100 years old. And we go, wow, 100 years old. And in Charleston, they go, 100 years old. This church is from the 1600s in Charleston. And so we got to visit some of these wonderful churches. In fact, stayed across from uh, Mother Emanuel AME Church. And they're building a, 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 a memorial there to what happened in 2015. But anyway, as we went through, we, one of the ch- graveyards learned that there's a difference. If a church has a cemetery right alongside, it's a graveyard. If the cemetery is in another place, it's a cemetery. Did you all know that? I didn't know that. Anyway, there was a graveyard, and in and, and one place, one facility, and I hesitate to call it a church because they actually host ghost story tours. Now, if you go to Charleston, you can go and do a haunted story tour. And I emphasize you can because I am not going to do that. There ain't no way. But at, at one of the places, you can gather there and, and, and do that. There was another church, though, and they had a plaque in front of their graveyard that read, The only ghost you will find here is the Holy Ghost. It was good. It was good. It wasn't in your face. It wasn't ugly. It was just a declaration, a declaration. We visited another church that was closed. We wanted to go in it, so we walked around in their graveyard just a little bit. And other than on a few of the headstones, you got a taste of a reminder of the gospel. It was not a gospel garden. In fact, they had real estate-type signs throughout the garden warning about climate change. And it was law and guilt, law and guilt, law and guilt. There was no good news. There was no gospel. I I was greatly disheartened. Why in the world would you leave out the main thing unless you don't believe it's the main thing? Law, not gospel. Gospel. Though all humanity through Adam live under the reign and the, of sin and, and death, in Jesus Christ, all those who are in Christ by faith, believing the gospel, live under the reign of grace. God has always dealt with His creation in a binary fashion. He created animals and human beings, male and female, one or the other. And here we read that everyone, all humanity, is either in Adam or in Christ. There's not a third category. In Adam, we live under the reign and power of sin and death. In Christ, we live under the reign of grace, sin and death, righteousness and life. Later in Romans, Paul will be developing and clarifying what does it look like to live under the reign of grace. And the first of all, it, it means this, that we, that we are no longer living under the reign or under the power of sin and death. Living under the reign of grace doesn't mean that we live without restrictions, boundaries, uh, distinctions between good and, and evil. It, it means that we do live in the freedom to glorify God and enjoy God every moment of every day and all things. It leads to life. It leads to liberty. It leads to flourishing, and not just for ourselves. It leads to flourishing and blessing for those around us if we live under the reign of death. It means that we are not keeping points or keeping track either of what we do for others or what others do for us or what we think God owes us because of the things we've done for God. Points are based on a merit system. We get what we deserve. The wages of sin is death. That's living under the reign of sin and death. 
But living under the reign of grace means that we're not keeping score about what we do for others, what we do for God, what others owe us. The simplest and still probably most accurate definition of grace, at least in brief, is its unmerited favor. Ultimately, the cross is the display, the ultimate display of grace. Unmerited favor of God toward people, not on the basis of our merit or deserving, but solely on the basis of God's love and goodness and by the merited righteousness of Jesus Christ on our behalf. That's the gospel. That's the good news. In a sense, living under the grace, the reign of grace, the, the, the question becomes, who gets the last word? Well, many would say that death gets the last word. We all end up there. In fact, this time of year especially, we remember what? There's only two things that are sure in this life. Death and taxes. Yeah. Well, we've just finish doing our taxes, and one day I will fight life's final battle. And then, as the song says, when death gives way to victory. But in Christ, the last word is not death, it's life. He says, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Eternal life, to know me is to have eternal life, John 10.10 10 and John 17.3. And so there's this contrast between Adam and Jesus that runs throughout Romans 5, and Paul is saying that the power and the impact of Jesus is much greater than the impact of Adam. And the impact of Adam was significant, and it's been awful. It's brought ruin. But the solution is infinitely greater because Christ has abounded in winning eternal life for those who are in misery and in ruin through Adam. We will still have troubles in this life, no doubt. We will still face the valley of the shadow of death one day without question, but it all fades in comparison to eternity, to the joy and happiness that God has prepared for us without pain, without sorrow, without tears, without death. Christ has won this for us through His life, death, and resurrection, and through the work of Christ, through His perfect obedience to the law, His perfect righteousness, we are made and brought into eternal life. And that's what verses 18 and 19 here uh, emphasize. And then in verse 20 we read, now the law came in to increase the trespass. What does that mean? Paul is speaking uh, of, of the law of Moses summed up in the Ten Commandments. It seems like he's saying that God gave the law to make sin worse. Well, early in our series we talked about the law. We considered the three uses of the law and that one of the uses of the law is as a mirror. It, it shows us ourselves in comparison to uh, God's perfect righteousness and holiness, that standard, and in seeing that we fall short, that we would uh, flee then to God for His mercy in Christ Jesus. We would see that we need a Redeemer and a Savior. That's what the law does for us. There's a second use. It's a restraint upon evil. It helps to curtail those who want to do evil. And when that restraint is lifted or those go against it, we see. If, if you've seen any of the images coming out of Ukraine, you get a sense of what depravity looks like when it begins to get unleashed more and more and more. We see that. So the law restrains evil. And the third thing it does is it acts then as a tutor. For those who are in Christ, it tutors us on what does righteousness and godliness look like so in sanctification we can be growing in that manner. It's a, a help for us in that way. But the law is never intended to save us. It was never intended to be a means of righteousness for us. The law doesn't create sin. That comes out of our own hearts. But the law defines it and it condemns it and it reveals it for what it is. It's sin. It's not mistakes. 
It's, it's not um, sickness, it's sin. In verses 20 and 21, there's a greater measure of grace in this world than there is of sin and of evil. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Think about the implications of that. Suppose that God removed His grace, what would happen? Well, we, we get glimpses of that in evil. In the first chapter, verse 18, the wrath of God is described in that manner, God removing or withholding grace and letting people do what they want. It's living under the reign of sin and death. It's, it, it's a foretaste of hell. And as we read this, we're reminded that there's virtually no heinous act that I am intrinsically incapable of doing, even as a Christian. In Romans 7, we will see more of that conflict and that struggle in the Christian life. But in Christ... He's constantly leading us to repentance and a growing obedience and sanctification. Beloved, we are either in Adam, living under the reign or power of sin and death, or we are in Christ, living under the reign of grace. Romans makes clear that, that all humanity is under Adam, affected by the fall. We're unable to save ourselves. It's kind of like this. Imagine that we are all on a luxury cruise liner. We've taken off, we're excited, it's beautiful, it's extravagant, the food is amazing, the music, everything is going great. Did I mention it was the Titanic? <laughs> we're on the Titanic together. And you know, it really doesn't matter when you understand that, whether you're on the upper deck with all the creature comforts, or if you're on the lower deck, if you're all going to end up in the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, it really doesn't matter what deck you started on. There was one solution. It was lifeboats. Now, what was one of the problems with the Titanic? There weren't enough lifeboats. Why? Because it was unsinkable. It was the unsinkable Titanic. That human arrogance got in the way. There's no need in cluttering up the perfect ship with lifeboats. Who in the world would want to leave the extravagance of the Titanic for a dingy little boat like this? Well, there was a lot of people. More than would fit. And it's human arrogance that gets in the way of the gospel. When we think we don't need it, we think we're just fine that our boat is going to arrive just where we want it to, just on time. There are two communities, one characterized by sin and guilt, and the thing I notice more and more about it is that community wants to push guilt on others. Even guilt we're not guilty of. The other is by grace, the community of grace and faith in Adam or in Christ, on the Titanic or in the lifeboat, if you will. In verse 17, we read, death reigned through that one man, Adam. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones summed it up like this, the world is a place of cemeteries. Death reigned through Adam. We need cemeteries everywhere. It would be quite a sales pitch to say, come and live at so-and-so. We don't even have cemeteries here. Whoa, what's going on? Well, there is such a place, but it's not local. Formerly, death was our king. We were slaves under its tyranny. In Christ, death doesn't get the last word. And one day, death will be destroyed. Death. 
So verse 19, we see the contrast between disobedience and obedience. For as by the one man's disobedience, that's Adam, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, that's Christ, many will be made righteous. Well, what obedience is this? Well, first, he did indeed have to live a sinless life. Jesus lived without sin and perfect righteousness, keeping and fulfilling the law, that which we cannot do, Jesus did in our place. But he was obedience took him even, as Philippians 2.8 says, he was obedient even unto death, even the death on the cross. That's the obedience that sets us free. Now, the law came to increase the trespass. This was shocking news, particularly for those of a Judaistic background. They thought the law was given to increase righteousness. More law, more law. One rabbi even said, more Torah, more Torah. We need more Torah. The thought was given that to increase righteousness... You need more law. There's still many who have that understanding today. I suspect that we live in a country that has more laws than all or any other country there is. Law doesn't make for righteousness. We have civil unrest. We have hatred. We have places it's not safe to go. Well, we need a law against that. We have the laws against that. The law can't change the human heart. See, the reality is that sin is a far deeper problem than the fact that we sin. It's that humanity is under the power of the reign of sin and death, and law cannot fix that. There ought to be a law against that. Well, there can't be. But God has made ample provision for the increase of sin by what? The increase of grace. But where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Verse 20. So there's this antithesis, grace and life or sin and death And the reign of sin never brings life. Verse 21, as sin reigned in death, it never brings life. Grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life. Because grace forgives sins through the cross. Grace bestows on sinner both righteousness and eternal life. It's grace that satisfies the thirsty soul. It's grace that fills the hungry. It's grace that sanctifies sinners and and helps to shape us more and more into the image of Christ. It's grace that perseveres even with the wayward and the obstinate. That's good news. Grace that's determined to complete what it's begun, Philippians 1.6. And one day grace will destroy death and consummate the kingdom of God in its fullness. And when we are convinced, church, that grace reigns, we will remember that God's throne is what? It's a throne of grace. Hebrews 4.16, and we are encouraged to come boldly to the throne of grace where we will find mercy, receive mercy, and find grace to help us in every need that we face because it's a throne of grace. He's the king, and he invites us to come there. This is all through Jesus Christ, our Lord through his death and his resurrection, and this emphasis is going to continue to unfold in chapters 6 through 8. We are in Adam by birth, which means all people. We are in Adam by our birth. We are in Christ by a new birth and faith. As in Adam, all die, and by all it means all, every single human being. The world is a place of cemeteries. All made alive mean that all who are in Christ will be made alive. They are made alive. Alive in Christ, that is our hope. And so we 
have the reign of life. This is such incredibly good news. Uh, Verses 12 through 21, Pastor Drew was taking the the first part of that last week as he looked at the multifaceted gospel. Uh, As we look at the, the rest of the chapter today, we see all of it so that it's a solid ground for us to have confidence that a large number will be saved, that the scope of Christ's redeeming work It's not universal. It is not that everyone will be saved. That is clear in the Scriptures. But it's extremely extensive. John Calvin puts it this way regarding verse 20. The grace of Christ belongs to a greater number than the condemnation contracted by the first man. For if the fall of Adam had the effect of producing the ruin of many, and it did, the grace of God is much more efficacious in benefiting many since it granted that Christ is much more powerful to save than Adam was to destroy. Charles Harge, following in the steps of Calvin, says, The gospel of the grace of God has proved itself much more efficacious in the production of good than sin in the production of evil. The benefits of salvation far outweigh the evils of the fall. We have reason for hope, for great expectation that there is power in the gospel and God's heart is to redeem and call a people to Himself from throughout the world. And that spurs us on then to the task of missions and evangelism. Living under the reign of grace, we proclaim the good news and we do so with confidence and we do so with expectation. It's not like the guy who comes and knocks on your door and says, I don't suppose you would like to buy a solar system, would you? How many solar systems do you think he puts out? Nope, you're right, I don't. Thank you, bye. But with an expectation, not selling anything, I am declaring and proclaiming the good news to those who are in Adam living under the power of sin and death, that there is grace and life in Christ Jesus and believing that there are people that God through the Holy Spirit is going to open hearts and ears to receive the good news. We are called to preach the gospel to the nations and to believe. Not, we don't understand exactly how all that's going to work, but that God's grace will triumph in the end. So that as sin reigned in death, verse 21, grace also might reign, reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Church, is that your vision? Personally, is that your vision? Is it our vision? Is it in our view of ultimate reality, who is on the throne? Is our vision filled with Christ Jesus crucified, risen, and reigning? on the throne, that we can trust Him? Or is guilt still reigning and death? You hear it all the time. Guilt and death, guilt and death, guilt, guilt, guilt. Or is grace reigning in life, in your heart, in life, and vision? Now, to be sure, I, I, don't, I don't live in an ivory tower. Sin and Satan seem to be reigning still. They seem to be. Many still bow down to them. But their reign is a bluff. It's an illusion. And the enemy wants you to think he's winning and to be afraid. And the little bit of news I listen to tells me all the time, be afraid, be afraid, be afraid, be afraid. But I'm not afraid. The cross, Colossians 2.15 tells us, is where the enemy was decisively defeated, dethroned, disarmed, And Jesus now reigns exalted to the Father's right hand. All things are under His feet. He is welcoming the nations. He is waiting for His remaining enemies to be made what? His footstool. Psalm 110, verse 1, Ephesians 1, 
20 and following. Adam's transgression brought condemnation. Christ's voluntary sacrifice of himself lead me to the cross. That's where Christ went. And he went there and he brought justification and eternal life. Grace is far more effective than sin. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. The problem is this. The problem is worse than we think. The problem is certainly worse than what the world thinks. But the solution is better than we think, and it's immeasurably better than the world even dares to imagine. Because the problem is not just that you and I sin. The problem is that sin and death reign through Adam. And God and Jesus Christ is dealing with both problems, both our personal sin and the power and reign of sin through Adam. Christ's death and resurrection breaks the power of sin and death. In Christ, we're already living under the reign of grace. How does that and, and, and how will that affect how you live, how you think, how you interact with others every day of the week and each day of your life? Knowing that you live under the reign of grace if you are in Christ. And if you are in Adam, you do not. But the invitation today is clear to receive Christ. Come under the reign of grace. And live with abundant freedom. To live increasingly to the new nature that we have in Christ. To glorify God and enjoy Him in all things. To please God and feel His pleasure as we take pleasure in Him. That is the call of living in grace. William Hendrickson, one of my favorite New Testament commentators, writes, Did grace merely offset sin and death so that mankind returned to the state of innocence? that of Adam before the fall? In other words, did he just erase what had gone on to put us in a new place so we could start over and try harder? One of our golfers in the first service said, you know, grace is not a mulligan. Because in a mulligan, you get the ball back and you start over trying again. It's not about starting over and trying again to get there this next time. God's grace draws us to himself. And drawn to Christ, he is our motivation. Rules and law will never motivate us to righteousness. But grace motivates us to righteousness. We can never get there any other way. God's way. The way of grace. And then as we receive Christ, he is our salvation, he is our righteousness, he's the one that we trust. In fact, we acknowledge our own inability to get it right. But I will trust the one who makes it right every day and in everything. That's living under the reign of grace. And beloved, I would submit to you that that is the only way to really, really live is in the reign of grace. Father, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you that it doesn't return void. We thank you that even today you are encouraging, you are drawing, you are transforming people. Encouraging your people who are in Christ and drawing those who are yet in Adam to come to the saving fountain of Christ Jesus and be cleansed and live under grace. We praise you in his name. Amen.
This is God's blessing from Acts chapter 20. May God and the word of his grace build you up and give you the inheritance among all that are being sanctified this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace and thanks for coming.